I agree that this scene is a tableau, and even that Thompson is correct in discerning indigenous cultural persistence across Spanish and American colonialism. However, her explanation of the scene around the Victrola is patronizing at best, in seeing these native women acting as if they themselves were only some kind of vinyl upon which a deeper and essential Chamorro cultural attribute continued to play itself out over and over and over again. While it is true that the Chamorro cultural repertoire of the Chamorita features repetition in sound and verse, it is also a genre about creative improvisation in the service of banter and competition. Thus, the Chamorita is just not about traditional and authentic culture simply repeating itself over and over and over again. Furthermore, the nurses may have simply been fascinated with the technology, or they could have just liked the song. More likely, these Chamorro nurses may have just been taking a fun break from their work, and the Victrola, like other new things and ideas that have washed ashore, offered Chamorro, Chamorro's new forms of leisure and diversion, along with the new forms of work introduced by the Americans. At the same time, however, this pre-war tableau at the hospital also helps us see how new modern forms of leisure might have also been practiced in ways that served tradition. This tableau also contains historical and cultural elements that help us see how such continuities and discontinuities produce significant, significant excuse me, tensions from which many would seek extended moments of fun and escape. This kind of cultural repetition might be seen as an assertion of new and emboldened forms of Chamorro womanhood, especially in the face of a staunch Chamorro Catholic tradition that scorned Chamorro women for participating in things American, such as dances and movies. Indeed, as Chamorro Catholics around the island readied themselves to celebrate the solemnity of the body of Christ, the telling scene of some Chamorro women sitting down and repeatedly listening to a Victrola seemingly defied Chamorro Catholic conventions and expectations since, as Vince Diaz's book Repositioning the Missionary points out, for all its cultural and political hegemony, Chamorro Catholicism was also non-monolithic and it did not have a monopoly over the full range of identifiable Chamorro cultural and political expression and consciousness. In their stories of hybridizing modern America with traditional ch Chamorro, the Patera experienced newfound freedoms, being able to earn money, but more than anything really, being able to help other Chamorro women give birth. I turn now to Agatha Johnston. Like the Patera, Chamorro women teachers such as Agatha Johnston also experienced newfound freedoms and opportunities, new social horizons that had been opened up in the work of Navy wives. In fact, the women who accompanied their Navy men to Guam were often themselves hired by the naval government as special laborers. And in their labor, predominantly as teachers, these Navy wives and even their older children often encouraged their Chamorro students to also become teachers. We must keep in mind that these white women encountered many eager and enthusiastic students, which is to say that there were many smart and intelligent Chamorros who did not need to be encouraged to seek and secure new social and economic opportunities not afforded them under Spanish rule, including liberal Spanish efforts at modern reform in the 19th century. Modernity, contrary to common understandings, did not begin with the United States. In any case, because of the interest and demand under the military's hierarchy, there quickly developed a teaching hierarchy, ranging from Chamorro teachers for the entry-level classes to Marines, yes, men, teaching the intermediate classes, and Navy personnel or their wives and daughters handling the advanced classes. It's equally important to flag how the Marines fit or were positioned or positioned themselves in this hierarchy. They are socially above the Chamorros, but subordinate to the wives of naval personnel. 
especially in the case of the wives and daughters of officers. These class distinctions take on an interesting and telling dimension when we attend to gender and sexuality and race. In relation to Chamorros who are infantilized as brown children in need of white fathers, the Marines are effeminized in their subordinated positions to white Navy wives who are contracted by their husbands to do the work that their own husbands either don't have the time or the sensibilities to do. As we shall see shortly, the naval government habitually referred to such work, teaching, but also health and hygiene, which is also seen as uh, extensions of household acts. The Navy uh, began, the naval government habitually referred to this kind of work and other matters of domesticity and domesticating the Chamorro as the small matters that were better and more appropriately performed by their women. Women's work, in other words, in this hierarchy, notice also how the Marines are fellow subordinates with the Chamorros vis-a-vis -vis the white Navy wives, even if all of them are subordinate to the Navy men, the, the naval officers, rather. Later, I will return to how this gendered and sexualized and racialized dimension of the hierarchy, especially as played out between the Chamorros and Marines, might help us begin to rethink the terms of engagement on the eve of the return of the Marines. For the moment, let me continue to tease out the social hierarchy, but now through the determinations of the island's geography and space. In his autobiography, Dr. Jose Palomo, the first Chamorro to receive a PhD, described one of the advanced classes, class number three at the Hagatna School, as the playground, as the quote unquote, playground for the intellectual elite. Palomo was in class number two, taught by a Marine. By the mid-1920s, when more schools were established throughout the island's villages, most of the teachers were Chamorro, giving us, through, giving us through this distribution a sense of how the Navy viewed Chamorros from outside the island's capital. By extension, this distribution also tells us of the clustering of intermediate as well as the intellectual elite in Hagatnya, and through these cohorts, the concentration of marine and naval wife teachers. This racialized and gendered hierarchical geography also brings us back to the island's landscape and how it is interpreted this time for the purposes of education and mobility. In his memoirs, Reverend Joaquin Sablon describes the clash in Hagatna between the expectations and values that underwrote the Navy's compulsory education and those of a well-established local Chamorro order. Reverend Sablon wrote that when the Navy passed its orders, thinking perhaps that the natives living in Hagatna were homogenous, it collided head-on into the stubborn walls of a two and a half centuries old class system forged out of Spanish Catholic hegemony. Hagatnya was divided into barrios, or districts, the oldest being San Ignacio, where the Manakilo, or elite class, resided. Most of these were elite Chamorros who had married into the ruling Spanish and later American class. Even in 1905, after the Navy had established comp compulsory education for Chamorros, the Manakilo, said Reverend Sablon, still kept their children from attending schools so as not to mingle with the lower class of Chamorros, who, by the sheer fact that they resided in Hugatna, were now afforded newer spaces. When he says newer spaces, I take him to mean that the Manakilo were quite anxious about the new social opportunities that the new education was providing the lower classes. These had the potential for equalizing and leveling the field, and thereby threatening their own hegemony. Sablon also pointed out that the Hagatnya River, which ran the length of the capital city, demarcated the lower from the upper classes. Education and explicitly modernizing an American strategy in the Navy's colonial objectives in Guam may very well have also been viewed by members of the lower class as a bridge and not just across the river. And perhaps male marine teachers were also seen as bridges, or at least guides across the bridge, 
who for their social proximity in the hierarchy may 